Live, brought to you from the Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. is our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Thank you. Well, we just have a great group of fans here from everywhere all over the country and we're happy to be with you again today tonight we're going to talk about the miracles of jesus that's why the people call me a fundamentalist you know i got <laughs> there was a european country they called me a fundamentalist i thought well there's nothing wrong in that at least you love jesus and you need to know that loving Jesus is the most important thing in your life. It doesn't matter who you are or how much money you have or how poor you are or how talented or untalented. We're all his children and, and we all have a special place in his heart. No one can take you know something? I, I'm going to get to this in a minute. <clears throat> But since it's my show, I could do what I wanted. <laughs> uh, if you don't make it to heaven, nobody will take your place. Did you know that? It'll be empty. You know, my grandmother used to make Italian bread. And uh, she'd slice it for supper, see. And I'd wait till she sliced it, and I'd wait till she's gone. <laughs> and I would, I would, uh, I take the loaf, you know, and I take it in the middle, see, and I squish it again. <laughs> I figured the middle was about even, so <laughs> she didn't know it got to be a shorter loaf. <laughs> And then I, I would put olive oil and salt and pepper and the egg and, I, and I'd run around the back of the house and eat it. <laughs> well, see, my grandmother never knew, at least she didn't tell me she knew, that I took that slice from the middle of that bread. That's not how it is in heaven. See, everybody don't suddenly get together and nobody knows you're busy. God sees that empty place forever and ever. Now, you don't want that to happen, do you? No, you don't want that to happen. You want God. I just saw one of our liberal brothers turned on some assault. <laughs> well, that's okay. Um. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Um. <laughs> Anyway, you want to be what Jesus wants you to be, what the Father created you to be, and what the Spirit works hard to make you be in his kingdom. So please, if you haven't gone to confession in a long time, please go soon. I want to read you a little bit about the scriptures. Um, 
there was in the life of Jesus many wonderful miracles. And St. John says that if, if all the things that Jesus did were written in a book, the whole world could not contain it. I like that. What a wonderful Jesus we have. Well, I like this, this thing about the, the cure of the woman with the hemorrhage and the, the daughter of Jairus who was raised from the dead. Now, I know you've heard it. It won't hurt to hear it again. So, when Jesus crossed into the, in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him. Just like you hear, large crowd, all waiting for him. See, on the other side. You got to use your imagination when you read scripture, otherwise it's blocked. Then one of the synagogue officials came up, Jarius by name. He says, my little daughter is desperately sick. Do come and lay your hands on her. And make her better. Save her life. Aren't these people simple with Jesus, huh? They didn't go around with big words. They went up to Jesus. You know, my daughter's sick. Will you heal her? Make her better. Is that the way you speak to Jesus? You should. My son is out of the church, Lord. Heal his soul, his mind, his heart. Bring him back. Simple. Well, so as Jesus went and the crowd followed. There was a woman who had suffered from a hemorrhage for 12 years. You know, that's a long time. It's a wonder she lived, but the worst part of it, she was considered unclean for 12 years. She could not go to the, to the synagogue for services. For 12 years, she was an outcast. Is there more to this than you think? An outcast. Well, I like St. Mark. He puts details in that nobody else does. You know, there's people who have details. You ever talk to some, a detailed person? All you want is the story. <laughs> you know? <laughs> all you want is what happened, when, and where. That's all you want. They come up and they say, well, I got up this morning. And you know what's coming. <laughs> I was sitting there drinking a cup of coffee, and I decided to go downtown. <laughs> well, what happened? Well, I got dressed. <laughs> <laughs> I got dressed, and I got on the bus, and I went downtown. And you're out of breath by this time. What happened? <laughs> well, I went window shopping. You went window shopping. Yeah, I went window shopping. And I saw all the things I couldn't afford. Fine. Why didn't you look at the stores you could afford? Well, I like to look at the things I can't afford. Why? Because it makes me feel good. Fine. Now you're downtown. What <laughs> happened? Do you, you know people like that? Huh? Oh, you're out of breath. And then when they tell you what happened, <laughs> it wasn't worth the whole story. <laughs> now Mark, say Mark. Say Mark with one of these kind of people. <laughs> but he did it in a right way. <laughs> but you don't find any other evangelist doing it his way. And I know one person probably read this thing only once. See if you can guess who it was. Now, he says that this woman had a hemorrhage for 12 years. Well, after a long and painful treatment, 
under various doctors. She spent all she had without being any better for it. Oh, St. Luke was a physician, wasn't he? <laughs> I bet he never read this more than once. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't that why it happens sometimes? You spend all you got, and then they say it's a virus. <laughs> <laughs> and you say, what kind of virus? Well, we're not too sure. <laughs> you won't die from it? Fine. What do I do about it? Well, time will tell. <laughs> Forty dollars, please. <laughs> I always wonder why we don't answer. Time will tell when you get it. <laughs> That's what I would think. Anyway, so here say Mark and I. He just don't get to the point. See, Jesus healed this woman. But he's got it in for doctors for some reason. <laughs> and he's not finished yet, so he's got to add this little thing. In fact, she's getting worse. <laughs> you know what I think St. Mark did? After, <laughs> I bet somebody back there got worse for it too. <laughs> You know what I think St. Mark did? I think St. Mark took that woman aside after everybody had gone and said, here, psst, psst. I'm going to write about these miracles. Tell me what really happened. <laughs> so she goes on and she says, I was sick for 12 years. I went to all these doctors. It was very painful and they never healed me. I took all my money. He went, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> So, she heard about Jesus, and she came up behind him. Boy, she didn't want any more doctors, you know. So she came behind Jesus. You know why she came behind Jesus? Because she was declared unclean. She wasn't allowed to go in the synagogue. And she didn't know what to do. And so she was so upset, and she thought to herself, if I could touch even his clothes, I should be well again. Wow. Mm. Well, and can you imagine, she's in a crowd of people. See, all these people here tonight were all bunched together, and Jesus in the midst. And this woman has to kneel down on the floor. She could have been crushed or just walked on. She kneels way, way, way down and she just touches his hem. Wow. What happened? All the source of bleeding dried up instantly. And she felt in herself that she was cured. Ah, uh, listen to this. Immediately aware that power had gone out of him. Now, isn't that interesting, huh? You, you don't realize that when you trust in Jesus and when you pray with a deep faith, that he will answer you somehow, sometime. Power goes out of him. Isn't that interesting? Power left Jesus. He felt it. He had a physical feeling of something draining out of him. And he turned around and he said, who touched my clothes? Oh, I bet she was Petra just petrified. 
Now, here's these old disciples, you know. You see the crowd pressing around you. Why do you say who touched me? Hmm. <laughs> Impatient. Can you imagine questioning God's question? Huh? But he didn't pay attention to him. He kept looking around. See? He kept all looking around. Now, he knew it was God who touched him. And then the woman came forward, oh boy, frightened and trembling. Because she knew what happened to her, and she fell at his feet. Now she's got courage. And in her fear, she has courage to face Jesus. That's why some of you don't go to confession. They don't have the courage to face Jesus. But you never need to fear, never. The woman came forward and she told him the whole truth. My daughter, he said, your faith has restored you to health. Go in peace and be free of your complaint. You know, our dear Lord wants to do miracles for us. Every day is a miracle for all of us, especially in this day and age. Ugh. Every day, there's either something more terrible than the next that happened. You look at the news, it's terrible. It's either slanderous or it calumniates somebody or more and more terrible things happen. And you wonder, where do I go, Lord? Go to Jesus. And you notice our Lord said to you, go in peace. That's what confession does. It gives you peace. All that money you pay on psychiatrists, well, some of you need to go. But some of you just need a good conscience, that's all. Confession is free. Well, while he's talking to these people, uh, the servants arrive and tell the official, your daughter is dead. Why put the master to any further trouble? <laughs> it sounds like some of us, doesn't it? Huh? It's too late. It's like Zachariah. You remember Zachariah when the angel appeared to him in St. Luke's Gospel, first chapter, told him that he was going to have a son. He's in his old age, and his wife is old, and he's going to have a son, and he's going to be the precursor, and he's going to be great. And Oh, he went on and on and on and on. What did Zachariah do? He said, oh, too late, buddy. I am too old. And so is my wife. Can you imagine talking to an angel like that? Huh? I would have wiped him off the floor. <laughs> Thank God I am not that angel. But Jesus had overheard the remark, and he said to him, do not be afraid. Only have faith. And he allowed no one to go with him except Peter, James, and John. Don't you wonder why our dear Lord picked these three all the time, huh? I bet the other apostles were jealous. They say, there he goes again, pick on those three. <laughs> What's wrong with the rest of us? Well, there was a reason. Peter was the rock, the first pope. James was the first martyr. And John was the eagle, the contemplative, the one who saw things no other apostle saw. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Nobody saw that but John. They tried to boil him in oil one day, but it didn't take. <laughs> he just sang all the way through it, so they pulled him out. 
and, and put him in Patmos, an island. He lived there till I think, uh, he, I think he came back at some point, but he died around 103. But he wrote this awesome book, The Apocalypse. So they all had a, Jesus had a reason for picking these three all the time. Peter would be crucified upside down. James was the first martyr, and John. Now all you old people, and I'm one of you, I'll be 73 on Saturday, in case you want to send a card. <laughs> <laughs> However, You ought to have great devotion to St. John. He did his greatest work when he was in his 90s. So, remember, there is before God no old or young age. There's only souls who are struggling in this body, this temple, to be like Jesus. So anyway, they came to the official's house and Jesus noticed all the commotion. You say, what commotion? Well, there were people, they hired people to weep and wail. That proves that one of my bright ideas is not accurate. I've always thought that the apostles were Italian Jews <laughs> because all they could think of was food. <laughs> but here I, I've got a, a little negative thing here because uh, an Italian family definitely wouldn't need to hire anybody <laughs> to weep and wail. <laughs> so that blows my theory, doesn't it? <laughs> So he went in the house and he said, why all this commotion and cry? Ooh. Definitely not an Italian house. <laughs> the child is not dead, she's asleep. Now, that's kind of interesting too, because in the scriptures, Jesus never called anyone who had died dead. He only called those who lost their souls dead. He always said they're asleep. Even Lazarus. He said Lazarus sleeps. He said, well, fine, if he's sleeping, then he'll get well. They're apostles, oh dear. they just never got the point until after Pentecost. He said, no, no, he's dead. So just imagine that, are you afraid to die? Jesus only calls those dead that have lost their souls. Let the dead bury their own dead. Ooh. But everyone else, she said, was asleep. Well, they knew she was dead. They laughed at him. So he turned them all out and taken with him the child's father and mother and his companions. He went into the place where the child lay. Taking her by the hand. Oh, I bet those people were wondering, oh, what's he doing? He said, Tanita Kum, little girl, I tell you, get up. Oh, can you imagine if your child just died and all of a sudden this person comes in, takes her by the hand and says, right. And the little girl got up. At once, 
got out of bed and walked around. She was 12 years old. Now, that certainly should be enough, huh? I think what comes next is so awesomely godlike, and none of us would have said it, and none of us would have done it. <laughs> he said they were overcome with astonishment. They're looking. And he said, don't tell anyone. <laughs> How are you going to hide that? <laughs> but the next thing just, I think, is awesome. He said, give her something to eat. I think even Jesus had a little Italian in <laughs> I tell you, who would think of giving that kid something to eat? She probably hadn't eaten. She may have died of a fever or emaciated. And he said, yeah, forget the miracle. Give her something to eat. He did the same thing with the uh, apostles and disciples at the, at, at, the, uh, at the river, the Sea of Galilee. They come in, they had caught nothing, and, and he had fish. He made breakfast for his apostles. And now he tells that this awesome moment of, of raising a girl from the dead, he thinks of food. Why? That's where we are. Jesus came down, 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 down from his level to ours. So thoughtful is Jesus that he thinks of this awesome miracle as nothing but give her something to eat. Why are you afraid of Jesus? So, why are you afraid? It's a mystery, isn't it? It's a mystery. That we, who should have miracles in our mind and heart, uh, and be so awestruck by the miracles of Jesus. You know, some people in today's world, these theologians, whatever you call them, they, they try so hard to take away every miracle that Jesus, explain away every miracle Jesus performed. All of you, those of you in hospitals listening to us this evening, and those of you who are home sick and lonely, don't be. Give your pain to Jesus, he gave his for you. Don't be afraid to die. If he raised this girl and got her something to eat, his arms will be out for you. You have a loving Jesus, a Jesus who came down and wept and cried and bled just for you and me. Mm. Why are we afraid? We have a call. Hello? Hi, Mother Angelica. Hi, where are you from? I'm from New York. Great. And what is your question? Um, well, first of all, I want to tell you that I'm enjoying your show this evening. <laughs> and um, my question is, Sunday was the Feast of Divine Mercy. It was? Yeah, it was. <laughs> and the um, priest at my parish didn't mention it at all. <laughs> and I was wondering if you would know why. <sighs> you really want to know what I think? <laughs> well, I can't tell you what I'm thinking, because you'd beep it off for TV. It's a grave injustice to the people. 
know what bothers me? When you take away devotions from the people and you don't teach them the faith and the beauty of Jesus and the spiritualities in the church and her doctrines, and most of all, you don't teach the Eucharist. If you robbed all the banks in the world at one time, if you took away every possession of every individual all at one time, it's nothing compared to what you take away from one person when you don't teach them the truth. I hope he forgot. <coughs> but some churches didn't even have Holy Week, so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say he didn't on purpose, but maybe he forgot, maybe he didn't. But I think you need to pray for him. Next year, I'd get um, leaflets and books and give them out in front of the church or a block away. But I would petition mercy upon him and the whole parish and ask Jesus. He's very generous. Jesus is awesomely generous. And, and he will give them the graces if you ask him that they might have had. Mercy Sunday is a great day because the Lord gives great favors on Mercy Sunday. I took my retreat this Mercy Sunday. And, and it was awesome just to sit in the chapel and just to see this, this awesome God who humbled himself in the Eucharist to be there and giving all these people. We had three Masses and three Holy Hours. People coming all day long just to see him pouring out his grace, his mercy, his goodness, his compassion, his love, his forgiveness on so many people. I wish I could answer that, honey. But we can't. We have another call. Hello? Mother Angelica? Yeah, where are you from? I'm from Kansas. And what is your question? Um, today, my son and his wife uh, miscarried their first child. Huh. And five months ago, my other son and his wife miscarried their first child. I would like to know what the church's teaching is on where these babies are. I have read that Our Lady has all the little aborted babies, and I can, I can just picture that. Also, I would like to know, you know, the doctors say that a lot of times these miscarriages occur because there was a deformity or something like that. Well, we know God has made the child, and God doesn't make mistakes, but yet we know he allows things like this. So mm -hmm. I just would like your opinion on why these things happen like this sometimes. Yeah, I had the experience of going to a dear friend of mine's uh, uh, home, and uh, she was in the hospital, had a miscarriage, and the Lord gave me a prayer for her. I don't remember the whole thing, but it, it went something like, you have a child in heaven. And, and you know, if a child miscarries, the first thing you ought to think of is, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Make that intention. But that is a child. The church teaches it is a human being from conception. See, so you have a, saw, a daughter or a son. And I, I talked to someone one time and they, had, they said, we have had 15 children. I said, oh, 15. Well, five are in heaven. <laughs> Wonderful. See, they knew they had 15. So, it isn't, they, they, they haven't had the opportunity to hug them or to bathe them or to kiss them. But they will see them in heaven. They will see them. And they will touch their hand. And they're saints in heaven because they've never committed a sin. See? When these people die, all of you that have had uh, miscarriages, Oh, you're going to be surprised when you go to heaven. You had a child, just didn't have an opportunity to see it. But he's there, or she's there. 
Uh, if you have any idea what it was, name her or him. Pray to them. They will thank you for all eternity for bringing him even this far. And so I hope they too will rejoice that God has given them each a child. As real as I'm sitting here tonight. Pray to them and ask them for the things you need. And we'll pray the next one, our twins. <laughs> it won't hurt. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother Angelica. Yeah, where are you this from? Can shout it from Woodbury, New Jersey. And what is your question? I love you. Thank what you. it's about about the abortion. Uh huh. What it is. We storm we storm the White House, but it don't mean a thing. We get letters from them saying we can't do this, we can't do that. Well, we call them and we try to, but I think that the doctors, the doctors don't have any conscience. They don't have no conscience at all. They, uh, they just do it for money. That's all they do. And I don't know what's going to happen to them when they face our Lord. We need, to, we need to pray for them. And I, I met a doctor one time who had 30,000 abortions. And uh, he said he didn't know. He said, I never believed that that was a real baby. And I forget what happened one night that he began to realize they were all little children, you see. And he really repented a lot. I think a lot of it is ignorance. A lot of it may be it's a, they make oodles of money. But it never does them any good, I'm sure. Somewhere, someplace, there has to be a conscience. They're misguided, misinformed. And if they don't have a kind of faith in God, then it's... You know, if we did that to animals... I read where this celebrity, and I won't mention her name, loved to eat used, you know, little baby lambs before they were born. So they would abort these lambs so she could have this kind of lamb that she likes. I can imagine the animal societies all over the world in an uproar. An uproar that they have to abort a lamb so she can have the meat she wants. Isn't it awesome that we don't care about a human being with a soul made to the image and likeness of God? We do strange things today. Our values are all messed up. We worry about things we shouldn't worry about. Oh, I'm not, don't send me any I love my dog letters because <laughs> I love your dog too. <laughs> but your dog is not a human being. And if you wouldn't do it to a dog, you should do it to a baby. See? And I think this is so because the whole world has lost its realities, its values that are godlike. You know what our Lord did to the Tower of Babel? Well, we're much worse today. Their pride was great. Well, we've gone beyond pride. We take the place of God now. And some people call themselves God. Well, if you could look at yourself in a mirror, maybe you'd catch on. 
God, you're not. <laughs> we say, we, when you lose the reality of God, everything turns upside down. We have another call. Hello? Hi. Hello, Mother? Yeah, where are you from? Uh, Baltimore. Wonderful. What is your question? I have two quick ones, but they're very important. Okay. Uh, the first one is, could you re-clarify uh, the church's teaching on abortion when it comes to rape and incest? Mm -hmm. And secondly, is it permissible for a nun to conduct the pre Mass of the Priest Sanctified on Good Friday? Mm -hmm. And if it is or isn't, um, I'll, I'll wait for your answer. What advice would you give Catholics who attend such services? Walk up. You don't have a choice. She has no right to, to conduct. It's a blasphemy for her to conduct a, a service where the Lord Jesus dies for our sins. I would walk out. There would be no question. I would walk out as soon as she walked in. Okay. I wouldn't wait for the service. <laughs> that don't make any sense. If you wait and, and go to the service, you're condoning the one who did it. I guess you were so shocked it was service was over before you realized what was going on. So I don't have a problem with that. The church teaches that even in the case of rape, if there is, it's very seldom a child is conceived because of the trauma, but it does happen. And the church teaches you cannot kill a human being even for that, see, because no one has a right to take a life that God has given. The event is not a, is a violent one. But even at that point, we don't have the right to abort a child. We cannot commit one sin to overcome another sin. You can't do that. Two wrongs never make a right. And I know that's hard because some children, some women are scarred by rapes and incest especially. And I would take care of those people responsible. But you can't, it's not a reason for murder. We have another call, hello? Hello. Where are you from? I'm from Maryland. And what is your question? Mother Angelica, it's such an honor to be speaking with you tonight. Thank you. Mother Angelica, I have suffered from migraine headaches for mm. almost uh, 30 years mm. on a daily basis. And I have been to many, many doctors and had many, many treatments and still suffer with these headaches. And I was wondering if you could give me some scripture and some help and understanding. Well, there's many scriptures. There's nothing worse than a migraine headache. If you've gone to doctors and have you tried herbs? Are you there? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. No, I haven't tried that. I would go to a, a very good herb doctor. Um, I'm a great believer in herbs. You know, God made them before we made medicine. So, and God made medicine too. But there's a lot of, of uh, good herbs. Now, you have to be careful. There are, you know, funny people in every business. But there are a lot of good herbs that are really very powerful in helping. But since you've had it all this time, you have to embrace that awesome cross. And I would unite that terrible pain with Jesus when he had the crown of thorns. I would still go for my herbs if I were you. Uh, go to a herb physician. And then what I would do is, uh, in the meantime, is give it to Jesus for priests. For priests and religious. 
We have another call. Hello? Mother, this is Richard from Kansas. And what is your request? Uh, Mother, you know, you were talking about the partial delivery abortions. Mm -hmm. And this is something that uh, bothers me. What can we out here in the pews do in terms of devotion to Our Lady or special prayers or devotions that we can say? Uh, I mean, you look at what happens and, you know, it's all, I'm almost sometimes disturbing. Yeah, it's overwhelming. <sighs> I'm trying to figure out how to say this. I would pray right now. I think all of us should pray that our dear Lord will have mercy on the world. And especially this country. No country has been so blessed as this one. And we we seem to have forgotten. We allow and do terrible things under the guise of law. But laws can be unjust, unfair, even evil. I think we're beyond right now action. I think God must intervene. No political party is going to change anything. We've gotten so far we have to say, Lord, save us. And I I think it's the only solution is to pray, pray for our country, pray for the world. Something is happening to the world everywhere. There's wars and wars and wars, and people hate and hate and hate. And, and this country is constantly pushing God out of the way, out of the way, out of the way, even in the Catholic Church where they don't, some don't teach the Eucharist, they don't teach devotion, they don't teach our lady, they don't teach anything. So, I think the time has come for all of us to pray. And I say, Lord, come and save us. There is no other way. Well, we only got two minutes. Would you believe it? Seems like the time passed. Don't forget between your gas, electric, or water bill any bill at all. Uh, I have a little pitch going on. I suppose you're tired of hearing it. I'm tired airing it. But on June 14th, God willing, we will be all over South America, 24 hours Spanish. We lose almost 8,000 Catholics a day to other religions and no religion. We want to go around the world to say one thing, <coughs> come home, go to Jesus. There is a God and he loves you. If you want to do the same thing, then write to me, write to Mother Angelica. Irondale, Alabama, 35210. And together, we shall not only reach the world, we shall change the world. But we cannot do it alone. I need his help most of all. And I need yours in particular. So if you're tired listening to that pitch, I know just what you can do. <laughs> well, I love you. And I'd see you tomorrow night with a great guest. Bye now.